Welcome to the Straits Clan and the signal at the Straits Clan. It's great to have you here tonight. My name's Tame Warner Beely. I'll introduce you to my guests in a moment. Uh, but let me just lay a bit of groundwork for you guys before we get going. Why the signal? Um, this series of conversations at the Straits Clan was premised on the idea um, that we needed to cut away a lot of noise from general conversation. And the basic premise of the idea of the signal, if I can get this flicker working, these things never work when you want them to, do they? Sorry, Ting, can you move that on, please? Uh, anyone, anyone here familiar with analog radio or television? A any old people in the room? <laughs> there, there used to be a day when you'd have to tune in. The first, first thing you'd hear was just a lot of noise, and then you'd have to tune in until you found that signal. And the idea of the signal-to-noise ratio, a measure of the ratio of successful information, of useful information to false or irrelevant data. And the idea here is today, we're going to talk about our subject, and I'm going to ask our panel to try and separate the signal from the noise. And when we get to the end of the conversation, which will include you, I'll get on more of that in a minute, um, they're going to try and tell us what are, the, what are the signals you should look for in the general content uh, that you read in your daily papers. So the subject we're going to talk about today Oops, let's go back again. She, Trump, and the New Global Order. Uh, you've been reading about this in your media the whole time. We're not going to look at this particularly from a news perspective. We're going to try and consider uh, what are the really important elements that underline the current dynamics between these two countries within the context of all this stuff that you're reading in the newspapers. Um, when we talk about noise, there is no greater noise these days I in modern parlance, in modern discourse, than the noise that comes from politicians. And certainly, uh, one of those two politicians is making more noise than most. So wha why should we care? Well, the fact is, as the old saying goes, when the elephants fight, it's the grass that gets damaged. Uh, and so we really do need to care about what, what happens here. Particularly here in ASEAN, after the APEC meeting, it seems that everybody is now focusing on ASEAN uh, as a pawn in this, in this duality. So let's see how that works out. I'm going to start by just introducing a couple of the themes. We, um, we're going to focus on three major themes in the US-China relationship today. I'll just take you through them very quickly, and then we'll get to the panel and start talking. And let me lay some background here. Uh, Xi Jinping in Davos in January 2017 surprised everybody by being uber-capitalist and uber-globalist uh, and saying things like this, we must promote trade, investment, liberalization, and facilitation through opening up and say no to protectionism. This was literally two or three days before Trump was inaugurated uh, as President of the United States. Uh, a few months after that, towards the end of that year, this is what Trump said as he unveiled the new national security strategy of the United States. He started talking about how China and Russia were challenges and threats to the US world order. They are determined to make economies less free and less fair, to grow their militaries and to control information and data, to repress their societies and expand their influence. So already Trump came out of the blocks with a, a very distinctive and definitive contrarian approach to what uh, Xi Jinping had tried to do at Davos earlier on that year. In fact, there were 33 references to China in that document, the national security document of the United States that they launched that year. 33, all of them negative, all of them basically around the idea that China is, and that's a really interesting sentence to parse, maybe we'll get onto that, but basically that China is challenging and changing the international order, uh, and Trump was not really interested in having that happen. So these are the three themes we're going to focus on within that contest. Firstly, the trade war. This is, this is uh, what they were talking about in, in APEC. This is one of the, uh, the main issues that we're talking about right now. They're going to meet in Buenos Aires in a couple of weeks. Uh, we have to decide whether there's going to be a trade war. Singapore's GDP numbers today came out much lower than expected. Uh, again, people saying people are worried about a trade war, and Singapore, one of the countries that may suffer as a consequence. The media coverage of all of this tends to be fairly one-sided. This is the kind of thing that they present. If you read this article, which was in one of the Filipino papers, uh, it's all predicated in, in terms about how Trump is, uh, sorry, Xi is going to strong arm Duterte, uh, and there's going to be uh, the exercise of overwhelming power. There's a showdown, there's a clash, all this sort of combative fra framing and combative terminology. Some more headlines for you. It's all about debt traps, it's all about China controlling the situation, it's all about China oppressing those small countries. Is trade really about China overwhelming people? 
Let's have a look at what happened. John D. Montgomery was a professor at Harvard in the 1960s. He told this to the Council on Foreign Relations in 1962. In the, and he wrote a book uh, and a paper called The Politics of Foreign Aid, American Experience in Southeast Asia. Foreign aid as a political instrument of US policy is here to stay because of its usefulness and flexibility. So I present this as a counterpoint to everybody saying that China is somehow being uniquely aberrant in its behavior because this has been policy in global politics for an awfully long time. The idea that you can use foreign aid as foreign policy is not something that's unique to Xi and his new China policy. Let's move on to the next theme. This was the headline from the FT um, only a few days ago, and I, I think the FT reporter who wrote that was supposed to be here tonight. I, I don't know if she has come, but if she has, I hope she'll join in the conversation. Um, this is the, the next stage. It takes it into a much bigger field. Mike Pence, the US Vice President, has been having goes at China, including, them, including accusing them uh, of interfering in US elections uh, <laughs> recently. But this is the main theme, China's empire and aggression in China. Everything is painted as if China is uniquely beginning to cause trouble in the global order. And this is effectively uh, the biggest point of, of issue on this. You see the famous nine dash line, the area of sea that China is claiming, uh, and those parts that are most significant within that area of the South China Sea. Uh, and this is the picture that, uh, one of the pictures that went uh, very, was very widely covered uh, recently about how China has been building these bases in what was initially just atolls and, and under, underground sandbanks. Uh, they're building their military uh, capabilities in the South China Sea. No denying that, I think, unless this is fake news. I don't know if one of our panel knows anything better than the satellites are showing us what China is up to. But again, let's look at the other side of the, uh, of the equation. That little dot I is uh, Manus Island, which actually belongs to Papua New Guinea. But last week, the US and Australia said they're going to build a joint military base on there. Um, no one covered that. No one really said, well, why on earth does the US need uh, a military base on Manus Island? Uh, and let's make it even worse. Uh, why on earth does the US have 800 military bases around the world, uh, including a, a very large number? in Asia. Uh, those big yellow ones are bases with more than 100 bases within that circle. So the idea that China's bases in the South China Sea are somehow, again, a unique exposition uh, of a, a militaristic and emp empirical kind of intent, um, I think our panel needs the question tonight. And I'll leave you with this before we get to the panel. Everything that we've talked about about this uh, does tend to frame China as somehow being somebody that wants to disrupt and change and make worse the existing status quo. No one talks about how maybe China just wants to be part of the status quo, except for Lee Kuan Yew, who was prescient in so many things, and this is what he said uh, quite, quite some time ago. It's not that China doesn't want to be part of the global system. It just doesn't want to be part of a global system in which it doesn't get to have a, a reasonable say. China's history uh, as a, a global player is, as we all know, uh, very, very long indeed and very important. And China wants to be accepted as China, not as an honorary, honorary member of the West, I think is a, an interesting summary uh, of the situation culturally, politically, and thematically. So let's begin with that position. Um, I'll introduce my panel to you. Uh, Cha Kim Huat is a, a lawyer, a partner at uh, Raja and Tan which is a, a local law firm. He does a lot of business with China uh, and is very well versed in some of the issues that we're talking about. Um, Chetamir Nasarovich is the uh, professor at ESSEC. He's the head of the MBA program here, the EMBA program. Uh, and um, uh, forgive me if I'm not giving you your full due here, Chetamir, but uh, you started up the, the campus of ESSEC here in, uh, in Southeast Asia. Jonathan Fenby uh, is an author, a journalist, uh, and uh, an analyst. He is a uh, former editor of the South China Morning Post, uh, a long-time China hand, uh, a China analyst for trusted sources, T.S. Lombard, as they're now known, and the author of a number of books on China, and uh, a historian, of course, uh, whose latest book is at the back there, called Crucible. Uh, and I want you, Jonathan, to set the stage for us, if you would, because uh, the, the history uh, of the current world order that China is being accused of overthrowing, this glorious global situation that we're supposed to believe in. Um, just lay out for us how this came about and why China is not part of it anyway. Thank you. Uh, is, there, is there a microphone behind you? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Timor, and uh, good evening uh, to everybody. 
Uh, my new book, wi which is, as you mentioned, uh, is there for me to sign afterwards for anybody who wants to purchase a copy at a special rate, uh, is about the formation, really, of the world order that until very recently uh, has pertained. Uh, this came into being after the Second World War. And when we say global order, it must be said that at that point, quite important parts of the globe, India, Pakistan, for instance, or much of the Middle East, was outside this order. But basically, this was the United States and the Soviet Union facing one another with Europe between them divided down the middle and uh, the uh, Soviet Union wanting to uh, acquire and maintain a large security belt uh, to the west of its frontiers uh, into the middle of Europe and the middle of Germany. And with that uh, uh, situation came uh, a growth in American uh, power and above all, most important under President Harry Truman, of American commitment uh, to overseas presence uh, in a way that had not been the case after the First World War, of course, when America had retreated into isolationism. So you've got America, the outgoing power, uh, at that point. And we forget, perhaps, but uh, there are a lot of figures in my book um, which illustrate this. America was so much the dominant power in the, on the globe at that point, economically, militarily. It was the only power with the atom bomb, uh, for instance. Its GDP accounted for about half uh, the global total. Um, and it, its presence uh, throughout uh, the world was growing steadily but particularly in Europe with the Marshall Plan, which revived Europe, and in Japan, where uh, uh, the United States uh, re gave up, in, in the end, the idea of decartelization and bringing the Japanese economy down and reflated uh, Japan as a global player. With that went a so series of international organizations, the United Nations, which of course been set up during the war itself, the IMF, GATT, the World Bank, uh, and so on, and all the, the UN uh, agencies which there were uh, there. So out of this came the idea of a global order, which was basically run by America. It was an American world order. But what was interesting was that starting in Europe, most of the countries which joined this hegemon of the United States did so voluntarily because they saw the American system, American democracy, capitalism as uh, systems which they wanted to embrace. So you had this uh, setting up. And of course, when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1990, there were many predictions that we were at the end of history and the US order had triumphed forever. And what was the role and the, the place afforded to China. Very small, very small indeed. Mm. Uh, during the war, uh, of course, the Second World War, uh, China had been allied with the United States, but the United States was very anxious not to send troops, ground troops, uh, into China. Uh, they, China tied down perhaps a million uh, Japanese uh, troops. I've written about this uh, too. And um, China, at the end of the war, uh, of course, uh, went into the civil war between the nationalists and the communists. And really, that took China out of the global system as such as it existed at the moment. And interestingly, the main American strategic planner of the time, um, a diplomat called George Kennan, uh, wrote uh, papers, which I have found and have uh, in my book, where he very much says, forget about China. It's never going to account for anything economically and, and industrially. And, and for 30 or 40 years, he was absolutely right. There. right so, so Concentrate on Japan. Kim Watt, excluding China at that point would seem to make sense in, 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 the, in, the, in the sense that it, it really didn't have any influence, any power, or really any interest, I suppose, in, in what was going on in Europe at the time. But subsequently, of course, with Deng Xiaoping in particular, we, we began to see a change of attitude. So look at the kind of history that Jonathan has been talking about from a, a Chinese perspective, if you would. Uh, uh, well, I'll, I would not say that I represent the Chinese uh, uh, to, to speak, but uh, before I start, you know, as lawyers, we typically say our disclaimer first. <laughs> as you can see, there's alcohol before me. So in Singapore, some of you know, uh, intoxication is a defense in law, right? For your actions 
in whatever you say. Remember that, because it could, it could be helpful in any number of ways. Except <laughs> when you drive, right? If you drink and drive, then you get yourself in trouble. But, but with that, really, if you were to look at uh, China in the recent history, and you mentioned Deng Xiaoping, actually Deng Xiaoping visited Singapore almost 40 years ago, you know, uh, and the anniversary being a couple of days ago. Uh, when Deng Xiaoping visited Singapore, uh, in, uh, they actually wanted to understand how can they get out of poverty? Because at that time, China was just out, communism, 10 years of cultural revolution, they can't find enough to feed the people. Their intention is, how do I get out of poverty? How did Singapore actually get out from you know, uh, uh, your colony, the breakout from Malaysia, and how did you, you know, try to find jobs, find homes, and find food to feed people? So that's why he came to Singapore, and then went back. They decided that to do so, you just have to open up the Chinese economy. So hence comes you know, 40 years of liberalization. And what has China done throughout these 40 years? I think, number one, obviously, it has lifted more than 100 million people of poverty, right? Number two, I think when China joined WTO, the intention was actually not to conquer the world. It was really how to get hope again in the world trading system so that they can create more jobs. And frankly, uh, if you were to look at trade war, I would ask... Uh, who caused the trade war? I don't think the trade war is actually caused by the Chinese people per se. Uh, if I recall, at that time when Zhu Rongji was the premier and Clinton actually was the president, and then they were evaluating whether to have China join WTO, I recall that uh, Zhu Rongji hosted Clinton in Suzhou, where Singapore has a township. And he brought Clinton to say, you know, this is Adidas. Adidas apparel is manufactured in China, right? So what do the Chinese factories do? The Chinese factories actually, uh, they source for the material in China, they cut the material in China, they provide the labor, you know, to make the apparel in China, the overheads, everything is in China. <coughs> and the so-called FOB price of China is about two US dollar, all in, eh? Material cost, labor cost, overhead cost, land cost, everything. And how much is it being sold in US? It's fifty dollars. So who earns what? You know? For all my costs, two dollars revenue, and then you sell at fifty dollars. Let, let's I, let, let's get into the, 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 the minutiae of trade in a second. I just want to stick for the moment to the macro picture. And the idea here that uh, as Jonathan said, uh, China was was not included. And the uh, the Lee Kuan Yew quote I talked about. I, I'm looking at China as a country that was sitting on the outside of the, of the global order that was formed, not only World War II, I mean Versailles before that, the idea that the global order was determined by a set of principles that were, de that were decided by the West it is something that has rankled, I think, for a while. Uh, and the idea that China is now hitting back against that, how should we see that? Is this actually China being imperialistic? Is it China being aggressive, or is it China simply saying, we get to have an equal say at this table? Uh, that, that's why I wanted to say that part of history to show you that the preoccupation of the Chinese have been always that how do they find more jobs to feed their people, right? Although they have lifted 100 million at least up from poverty, there's still a huge mass of people in China. So they are I don't think that they are at the stage where they think that I'm strong enough that, you know, I want to conquer the world, da-da-da-da. But what has changed in recent years is this. As China becomes stronger, a lot of the cities get more developed, and there are also political changes. So you have uh, the recent leader, which is Xi Jinping, which is actually quite unique, because in China, there's always sort of a balance of power, right, between various camps. And somebody will hold certain positions, and others will hold uh, other positions. There's a check and balance. But it's through this latest leadership transformation that Mr. C actually holds all three key positions. So it does seem that under his leadership, China has become more assertive in various fronts. So you are saying that are they trying to challenge the world? I don't think so. But have they become more assertive? Probably yes. So then Mr. C came out with this Belt and Road. I'm not sure you have a Belt and Road picture up here, but it's not difficult to imagine if you look at any Belt and Road map, you can just Google, what does it say? 
it covers what we call the old land-based economy. Land-based, as in before America was founded, before you know your steam, uh, land-based. That means the belt leads to Europe, the road, even the sea road leads to Europe. The maps stops there. You know, it doesn't go across to the Pacific. So I suppose when you have this belt and road, the Americans must be saying, eh, where are we on this map, right? So ba I mean, basically, you're saying that you know the, the position in Beijing is is one of uh, principally started off as we need to sort out our domestic situation economically to deal with the poverty. Uh, but now we have a, a greater voice in, in the global situation. It's not necessarily an imperialistic voice. I'm going to hold that thought for a minute uh, and come back just to the third leg of this, Chedomir, is the finance. The global institutions, Jonathan mentioned a few of them. I mean, we went through a whole series of institutional building exercises. We had Bretton Woods, we had the General Agreement of Tariffs and Trade, um, we had the World Bank, the IMF. All these institutions were constructed around the idea, uh, initially the gold standard, but uh, the dollar dominance and the trade dominance of the United States meant that they controlled the finance and the business arms around the world. So here we are, um, you know, 90 odd years after that. And again, just look at that picture as if you're a Chinese person and say, this system was set up for a purpose and we weren't part of it. Is that, is that a fair comment? Maybe I'll take this one. Can yes, uh, sorry for that. I would say that uh, concerning the uh, financial dimension, uh, from the Chinese point of view, they will adopt a pragmatic policy on this. If it serves them to use the U.S. dollar, they will use it. If uh, they believe that uh, there is a, uh, let's say, a political domination of the United States because of the U.S. dollar, maybe they will change, but they cannot change it alone. But the question is, the practical reality facing not just China, but the rest yeah. of the world is that these global institutions are designed to serve a purpose, and yeah. it's not uh, yeah. an egalitarian purpose. So the, the U.S. dollar... Uh, I remember when it was uh, concerning Bretton Woods and the others, there was a backing by the gold. And uh, since they lifted the gold in the 70s, this is where we have the problems concerning the local currency because the US dollar is at the same time a local currency and the international currency. So in that case, they can manipulate this uh, if they want to do so. And uh, since there is no gold standard anymore, we don't have any other alternative uh, for that. So we have to use the US dollar. Today, it is not only a question concerning uh, China, it is also a question concerning Russia, it is also a question concerning Europe, because uh, concerning, for instance, the Iranian uh, embargo, uh, there is a problem concerning the currency, because if you are using the US dollar in order to pay something in Iran and vice versa, this is where you will have problems in the United States. So, the because it is a local currency and the international currency at the same time, and we don't have any other example, which can uh, challenge this, we have problems. Don't, don't get me started talking about blockchain now. <laughs> <laughs> but, Jonathan, you were, you were talking about um, the institutional setup based on the premise that um, the U.S. was trying to promote democracy and freedom and all these great things around the world. Let's look at that in the context of the map I put up there as to the, the number of U.S. military bases that there are around the world and, and the... I haven't got the numbers off the top of my head, unfortunately, that the, the trillions of dollars that are being spent in maintaining military presence. How did we go from spreading democracy to having eight, 800 military bases of the U.S. around the world and complaining about China building a couple in the South China Sea? Well, I don't, I don't think the build there, there is a contradiction in the build-up. <coughs> in fact, because of the Cold War, as it developed, the Americans established an awful lot of bases, a lot of which came from the second, uh, have been there uh, during the Second World so War. what happened to the, uh, the Cold War dividend that, that we were supposed to have? Uh, it didn't really exist mm. because the, the military is strong enough and I think military lobbying prevented any cuts in the military budget there. So, uh, I think there is a difference, uh, if I'm saying that, that uh, with the South China Sea because China in the South China Sea is going into disputed territories and building its own bases there for development in the area, whereas American bases were 
established with okay, the now? agreement of the, the, the government running those countries. Okay, now? Yeah, okay, now we're at the end of the war, too. Okay. At the end of the war. I mean, na now it may evolve in okay. different ways, but certainly at the end of the war, Okinawa was very much, uh, the Japanese were keen to have... I'm trying to stir up trouble here. You're no, no, no. Because, no. yeah. I mean, let's face it, there, there, is, there, is a, there is a duality. It's not just Okinawa. I mean, you know, yeah. what are the British doing in the Falklands and Diego Garcia? What are... What are yeah, yeah. What, yeah. What, are the, yes. what are the French doing in, 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 the, in the South Pacific? Yes, I mean, that the, empi the French Empire controls uh, sea waters that spread way beyond anything theoretically they, have, they really should have access to. Yes, but I think there, there's... <laughs> there, you say theoretically and so on. Well, each, each case, we, we can say, we won't go into the detail there, has to be argued separately and so on and so on. But I mean, I think undoubtedly in the South China Sea, China has been expanding there to assert claims which it's had on the basis of the 1947 map. And it's done so against the wishes of a lot of the regional countries, Vietnam, Filipina, Philippines under Aquino, certainly, uh, and so on. And it has pushed ahead with that despite the UN arbitration uh, uh, ruling uh, and so on. And there, there is, I think, a difference here. Uh, I think uh, we must first recognize one thing. In this world, every country considers its own interests first. Singapore leaders have said as much. Everything else, pardon my language, is bullshit. It's just finding an excuse. And why do I say that? You know, as a lawyer, when a client comes to you for a case and say these are the facts, the first thing you ask them, am I the plaintiff or am I the defendant, right? Plaintiff, I can argue a case. Defendant, I can also argue a case, right? But the facts are still the facts. But the same set of facts, we can argue it differently. So that's the same. So everybody is trying to act for its own interest. Where they think the world order coincides with their own interest, they will say, yeah, this is good. Where it is not, they can explain why the world order is no good. Who is the proponent of free trade? I think it's United States, right? Multilateral system, WTO. They say that is good. And why suddenly that is no good? Because that is not serving its purpose anymore. Not that absolutely anything has changed. So, so the fundamental thing is that the clash now is between what I call the most developed nation in the world, US, and the most developing nation in the world, China. And anybody can tell you what the most developed nation can do and produce and what the most developing nation can do and produce. And because it no longer serves that purpose, so you need to have a new world order. So it's not a question of, in, in a theoretical sense, what is good, what is bad, left is good, right is good. No, it depends on the circumstances, the voters, and what serves the purpose. Yeah. And what you can get away with, I think, too. <laughs> <laughs> it's not exactly. Um, and and Brexit yeah, included. Brexit, no, yeah, well, we won't go into that. Uh, no, but I think that is very important, the, the, the point you make, that, you know, we say uh, the depictions of China, depictions of the United States at the moment, depictions of Britain or any, anybody else, but governments act in what they see as the national interest. And China, as you uh, intimated earlier on, under Xi Jinping, has taken a stronger view of what is in its national interest globally. That's, I mean, we remember Deng Xiaoping said, hide your brilliance and bide your time. Well, for Xi Jinping, the time has come and he is asserting that. And that's quite normal. Everybody asserts their own claims and interests. How, how does the, the Russian situation fit into this? Because you can see in Trump's um, behavior uh, any number of angles, <laughs> I guess, to what uh, Kim Hart was saying. It just depends on the circumstance in which you find yourself. But the American antipathy towards Russia today uh, is almost as great, in, in some cases, if not greater, than the antipathy towards China. Uh, what does that tell us about the, the global dynamics of what's going on here? Well, <coughs> the Russians or the Soviets, uh, as we used to call them before, uh, were always uh, the usual suspects concerning the United States. And the Chinese did not exist in this picture. If you are looking only at the James Bond movies, you couldn't find Chinese there, but Russians everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe not in the best <laughs> for Trey for them. So uh, for the Russians, they have already been there, and they will be there. Of course, there was a moment of, um, I would say, uncertainty with Boris Yeltsin. But after that, with uh, the coming of uh, Vladimir Putin, the situation is completely different. So Russia is back. Of course, they don't have the same, uh, the same uh, strength as they used to have before. But again, I mean, th what I'm trying to get yeah. to is here that the noise is 
uh, what we're told is that there is a threat from a uniquely evil individual or, or individual country that we must overcome. It's a zero-sum game. Is that the signal that we should be taking away from here? Or is the signal that actually this is just the continuation of foreign policy domination by the United States by, any other, by any other name? I'm not so sure that Russia is uh, the single one uh, who coul which could, um, let's say, represent the biggest threat. Mm -hmm. In the recent uh, demand from the French president, uh, Mr. Macron, concerning the European army, he identified three challenges or three enemies. So he said Russia, say China, and the United States. So this is why President Trump was not very happy when he went uh, to Paris uh, concerning the commemorations of the uh, 11th of November. But how come that the United States is becoming a measure while after the Second World War it was the guarantee of the freedom concerning Europe, especially concerning Western Europe, and now it has become a villain. <laughs> it's really strange. While for China, it has never been present in Europe. It has never been present in some other places. So I don't think that it is considered to be like a threat uh, concerning the Europeans. Let me get on to one of the other issues. Yeah. Um, Belt and Road, and particularly the debt trap element uh, that the Belt and Road is increasingly being framed by. So much of the coverage now is that China's intent in lending to the people along the Belt and Road is simply to gain economic leverage over them uh, and political leverage over them. Is that true? Is that fair? Uh, I don't think it's China's intent, but the way that some of the governments they have uh, dealt with there have overextended themselves uh, and so on has had that effect. And we can see this in Sri Lanka case, in the Maldives uh, and elsewhere, Nepal, uh, which you showed on your slide there. Um, so this is a byproduct, if you like. But I think Belt and Road is, it is an economic uh, project uh, to, an to, to, to a large extent, uh, but even larger extent, I think it is a political project to project uh, China's presence uh, into countries which need aid and preferably need aid um, with not too many questions asked. Project in a positive way or in a destructive way? It, it's neutral. I mean, it can be, it can be either. There. Because debt as, a, as an instrument of economic policy is fairly well known. Mm -hmm. Going into debt and offering to finance things through debt is in no way uh, controversial. The Sri, Lanka and the Sri Lanka situation in particular is an interesting case in point because to say that somehow this is uh, all China's doing is to deny agency to a certain number of other foreign players, isn't it? I mean, yeah. the, the Sri Lanka, in, in that case, Mahinda Rajapaksa, uh, went begging. I mean, he, he wasn't forced into yeah. taking that money. He wanted to build those projects for his own benefit. Well, that's what I meant. But mm. you know, it, it's, it's, it's more the doing of the recipient governments than China itself, I think. Uh, uh, yeah, I was just going to say that, uh, you know, the debt, as all of you know, uh, why would we be in debt? Because we want to borrow. And most of the time, I would say, more borrowers want to borrow than lenders want to lend, frankly. And uh, with respect, if there are bankers in town, lenders lend money to those who don't need money. Right? Unfortunately, those who need money will never get money from lenders. That's the truth of life. So, so the countries are in debt because they wanted the projects. Nobody is, is willing to do the project. Or in countries whereby people are willing to do the projects, let's just take the high-speed rail in Malaysia, for example. That's a Belt and Road project, yes. I mean, the country wants to do the project, yes. Is China the only contender? No. The whole world is contender, right? Look at the, the high-speed rail. Japanese are in there, the Koreans are in there, the Germans are in there, the English are in there. And there's an but the an Americans not, wanted not to the be British, there. Not the British. <laughs> we, we don't have high, we don't do high-speed trains. <laughs> yeah. When I say the British not to do run the rail, it's the signaling, si signaling system because mm. there are other parts uh, yeah, of yeah, the high-speed rail that, that comes with it that, that they form a concern. But there's so, so much attention now being given to the Africa situation. Uh, and in fact, China is still uh, not the largest lender in Africa. It's still the West. But everyone's blaming China for trying to enslave Africa in debt. It's, it's an interesting conundrum here. B again, in a historical context, the use of debt to gain economic and political leverage in smaller and less powerful countries is a time-honored uh, policy practice. Um, I'm just wondering why China is being uniquely scapegoated for doing what everybody else has done. 
I, I would say that China is not unique in this. Now the only question is, uh, will people really uh, give money back or not? Uh, because they may come from the different intentions. And I remember the situation in my former country, former Yugoslavia, there is one small republic called Montenegro. I remember where they asked for money, they knew from the very beginning they will never give back. And they were saying, we receive the money, they will build something, we'll say thank you, now you go back, we'll declare bankruptcy, but we still keep this. So, <laughs> so in that case, uh, it was really intentional. To I don't say that it is always the same case, but I know this very case when I was discussing with them, they are telling me, we just keep it, we'll keep it them for a moment, this is how they attracted the Russians to come to Montenegro. And after that, they are telling them, please, now, goodbye. Now you have to leave the country, but you leave everything that you have built. Keep your money. You yeah. cannot, <laughs> <laughs> you cannot uh, go back with all the uh, tangible assets that you have built there. So uh, just, to, uh, just to relativize uh, the situation here uh, for the Chinese, uh, if they were in a capacity to build something by their own, the Chinese will not lend them money. Why should they lend them money? Yeah. Right? I, I think uh, uh, if you look at Africa, for example, ask yourself, how many of the nations in Africa speak Chinese or French or uh, Spanish? French, yes. French, or French, yes. For example. <laughs> and that, that tells us a lot, right? I mean, uh, it's not just that. And I think fundamental to all this, as I say, everybody is looking after their own interests. It's a bit like uh, if you have parents here, you know, today is an important day for Singapore, why? Right? Because children in primary school today is the results, release day, PSLE results. So it's the feel of, uh, am, am, am I good enough? Am I competitive enough? And deep down, I think that is the issue. The issue is why you say Chinese is single out, because, I mean, through their technology, whether you say, you know, they copy it or they develop themselves or whatever, the Chinese contractors are really efficient and they can really beat very low prices. And people are fearful whether can I compete. And, and before I leave this train of thought, I'll just leave another idea why this trade war came about. It's really not about factories. It's really not about jobs, even though Mr. Trump said that. Would America want to bring back the pollutive industry, the factories, the menial workers? No. The underlying of all this is technology. Because U.S. is very fearful, I'm, I, I wouldn't say very fearful, it's concerned from all those things that I've said that can they compete with China on the technology front? Before anything else, some of you may have participated or have seen the statistics for the Singles Day sale. That's about two weeks ago. Mm. Look out for the statistics tomorrow, which is the Black Friday sale. Yeah, That speaks for itself as well. Check, check it out. So... China is a huge internet economy, right? Your Alibaba, your mm. Tencent, how they have combed Southeast Asia. How, how now, uh, I'm saying this, uh, uh, not trying to uh, do advertisements for anyone. My family is an iPhone family. Everybody has an iPhone. Because of the plan that I subscribe, every time, this time of the year, I upgrade my phone. And it coincides with the new phone's launches. So just last weekend, I was very busy. I told my son, can you please go and check it out? What sh phone should I buy? You know, there's XR, XS. There's just too many models to follow. And strangely, he came back to say, Daddy, don't buy the new X phone. Why? Because he says it's no good internet. Now they're in the Google, YouTube state age, right? They, 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 they found really, they, they told me why it's no good. Then I said, then what phone should I buy? He said, buy the Huawei. <laughs> Huawei Mate 20 Pro. That's the best. Leica lens, a couple photos. Of, a couple of gasps in the audience <laughs> there. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, 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 and that's why, because although that I've never, but he said, yeah. because he said, you look Leica lens, you look at the photo, you show me a X phone photo, a Samsung photo, a Huawei photo, you know, you can charge your phone without, by just putting two Huawei phones next together, they can transfer the charge to you, and the multiple functions. Yeah. And that set me thinking, why? It's really back to the technological war that, that, is underlying that, and that's why you need to shift that pattern. Did you want to yes, no, the technology is extremely important, and what we had, <coughs> I think the most, one of the most uh, interesting uh, episodes in this trade war was ZTE, which, uh, as you know, was forbidden 
to be supplied with semiconductors from the United States, which was quite a wake-up call, I think, for the Chinese leadership, and that Trump subsequently revoked that as a kind of gesture to Xi Jinping. Um, but you saw in the weeks after that tremendous uh, concentration by the Chinese leadership, including Xi Jinping, at a number of top-level meetings uh, of the need to push on advanced technology, and for instance on semiconductors, where China is way, way, way behind, despite all the money that it's spent, spent on that and needs to import uh, semiconductors. And these are important, uh, not only for civilian application, but also in the military. Again, only recently we had more accusations that China is stealing intellectual property and, and trying to benefit from U.S. Uh, uh, leadership in this front. But it, that's a whole different question that we, we won't get into because I want to bring in the audience now and, and start taking some questions and some feedback here. I mean, we've sort of covered a bit of ground here. We've looked at things from a number of different aspects. Um, I'm still uncertain, and I want you guys to wrap up at the end of the day as to whether uh, what is happening here is... Uh, the clash of the elephants uh, and the rest of us are going to get trampled, or is this just the normal process uh, of global inter international politics? Uh, but please, folks, uh, let's, let's have some questions from the audience. My name is Johan. I'm from Sweden, uh, but I work here in an American company, and I travel about monthly to Pakistan. Um, and um, Pakistan is really um, uh, interesting, I think, in this debate, because we have the uh, CPAC... Uh, um, the Belt and Road Project, which connects China to the Arab Sea. We also have uh, Trump, who just this week, I believe, said that uh, he would reject the uh, 1.3 billion they pay in aid uh, every year to Pakistan, seemingly because they didn't find uh, Osama bin Laden fast enough back in 2011. Um, so basically, what the whole presentation started with, like the two power plays, so like either foreign aid or the investments uh, are now being both used uh, very much into Pakistan. You just talked about uh, single stay and Alibaba. Alibaba owns the biggest uh, e-commerce players in Pakistan. They own the biggest uh, <coughs> uh, payment apps, etc. Um, if you were me and had to go back to my manager tomorrow and report on what is happening in the economy in the coming two years with this power play of US and China, what would you be telling him? To take that one. <laughs> okay, um, I was Testing. Yeah. I think the next two years economy is not going to be pretty. Oh. Yeah. If you look at the macroeconomics, uh, I, I think these are the experts. Yeah. I'm just a mere mortal lawyer, so just take it with a pinch of salt. But I don't think it's going to be pretty, because I think if you look at what's happening, uh, because of the trade war, what do the Chinese need to do? The Chinese need to uh, release more credit, which they did in order to stimulate the domestic economy. What does that result in? That result in a devaluation of the yuan, right? And that that actually caused uh, challenges to the supply chain. And if caused devaluation means the results of the Chinese companies are not going to be pretty. So I think for most Chinese companies, this year and uh, the Chinese call it nian guan nan guo. So this year end is going to be tough. Right, this year is going to be tough. So next quarter, I don't think the the, the, the result is going to be pretty. And I think uh, partly our own government, Singapore, has said that you know this year while we have survived, you know, the trade war, I think we may benefit a little bit from that from the supply chain realignment. But next year is going to be challenging. And unfortunately, I don't think the trade war people started off by think thinking that it's really Trump, it's an uh, individual, it's a personality. But it shows that it isn't. Midterm election came and gone, right? Has it changed anything? No. If you ask me, the G20 meeting down the road, would it change anything? I doubt so. Because the underlying fundamentals concerns are still there. The technology gap is still there. The trade imbalances are still there. Jobs differential are still there. So it's not going to, to be so quick. So it will take some more time before they realign the new world order. Factories takes time to relocate to new locations. And what are you hearing from the ASEAN summit the last two weeks from APEC? Everybody is looking towards ASEAN as the new playing field, so to speak. China is now courting ASEAN, right? 
Li uh, Keqiang came and said, oh, you know, uh, first he thanked Singapore for contributing to China's so-called economic growth and liberalization, and want more investments into China. South Korea is saying, go South policy. And you know, Taiwan has the ongoing go South policy. And Abe is saying the New Pacific is also South policy. Uh, specifically on Pakistan, I can't really comment on that, except that it does seem that Washington is becoming increasingly reluctant to fund Pakistan, which is going to, given the projects, given what is needed, given the port uh, and the whole uh, communications networks, is going to make Pakistan that much more dependent on funding from China there. Now, how ready China will be to get more committed is an open question, because quite apart from the financials uh, and so on of this, and the state of the uh, Pakistani government finances, which are fairly parlous, let us say, there is the whole security question uh, going up the, 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 the routes there. So um, I think that China is going to be the main supporter, continue to be so, because they've got a lot invested in that, but they're going to get more and more careful about what they commit to, I would guess. Yeah. <coughs> it's difficult to predict. Last time, it was just before the elections in the United States. So it was the day before I was in Brunei, and they asked me what would be the uh, results of the elections. I would say, of course, Hillary will win. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> Of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi, um, my name's Guy from, from England, again, living here. Um, there's, there's been a, uh, you'd say, a very positive move from China to b about investment and engagement in the region, not just in terms of trade, but also in terms of developing um, these countries uh, around here. And Xi Jinping's trip recently to the Philippines, also trying to engage them um, with regard to the disputed islands as well. And Pence seems to have, although it didn't work quite as well, obviously, in Papua New Guinea, but Pence's movement has been exactly the same thing, investment and engagement, although on a much smaller scale. But And they've said that they're not going to be doing containment, but that's kind of where they seem to be ending up with regard to the military side of things. So what's going to work? The containment side of it or the investment and engagement to try and counter what China's doing and, and, and increase U.S. In involvement in the region? Well, I think the containment has always been there, in fact. It's not something particularly new. Uh, if you look at the island chain, if you look at Okinawa, which you talked about, the Philippines, Taiwan, China has often felt hemmed in by the American naval and aviation uh, presence uh, not far off its, uh, its shores. Perhaps Trump has given more vocal, uh, as usual, rhetoric to that, but I think that's been there for some time. What is interesting, as you, you mentioned, is the way that Mike Pence has now been put up as the kind of bad cop uh, in this to uh, beat China over the head with his speech to the Hudson Institute and then again uh, at APEC. And I think we're in for something, how shall I put it, of a bidding match uh, for projects and for uh, government uh, friendship, if you like, in, in the region, Southeast Asia, in, involving China, involving the United States, but also involving Japan uh, and others. Can I just extend that a little bit? Because again, you know, we talk about containment, we're using the language of previous Western-dominated foreign policy priorities. Why are we not talking about language that includes China as an equal partner and a recognized player in the global situation? Gentlemen. Uh, <coughs> I would say that it is uh, changing the paradigm because uh, for all the history after the Second World War, China has uh, came out from the century of humiliation. So they remember well what was the occupation and the colonization of China. And it's very difficult for them to enter into any, let's say, uh, uh, into any domination or into any uh, trial uh, to uh, impose something to the other countries. It's in the DNA. We cannot, if I am the Chinese, we cannot impose others anything because we have suffered this for 100 years. So it's impossible even to imagine that. So now, with the... Uh, uh, trade approach, it's a completely different thing because in that case we are looking at the interest. 
of the country and the interest of the other countries. But from the military point of view, I cannot imagine that uh, China is projecting itself outside of its own shores and uh, trying to have a direct influence in the other countries, even if they are invited by the other countries, I'm not so sure that they would come there. Interesting, because that's not the way it's being portrayed. I'm just interested to know what the feeling is in the crowd. I mean, is the sense here that China is a threat militarily or economically, and its intent is to grab what it doesn't deserve? Uh, is, is put your hands up if you, if you think that the China situation is something that worries you at this point. Interesting. Interesting. Oh. Hi, I have a comment and a question. So uh, my name is Winnie. I'm, uh, I was born in Beijing, and I now work in Singapore. I work for a company called Hacklet. We do uh, quite a lot of political analysis, and we help multinationals enter uh, difficult places like China. So I guess my comment is that I personally don't think that China is imperialistic or expansionist. If you look at Chinese history, you know China built the Great Wall of China to keep the barbarians, which is the rest of the world, out, rather than trying to expand. Um, China has always been very inward looking. But I guess to answer your question about what worries me ch about China, actually, um, I'm going to ask my question about what worries me about China to the panelists, which is what worries you about China, and in particular, Xi Jinping. What do you think about him? Because you know, in the beginning, everyone says yeah, he's, in, he's consolidating power in order to push through reforms. But so far, all we've seen in his second term is still consolidation of power, particularly to Jonathan Sambi, the, his treatment of journalists and, and this control over, over media. Um, you know, This idea that everything has to adhere to Communist Party, socialist, uh, values, I, I think that worries me, um, and, and, and also the you know the recent announcement of the social scores and you know more surveillance over over everyday Chinese you know people uh, in China. So I wonder whether these are the things that worries you as well, and if not, what are the things that worry you about? Well, China? I mean, there are, there are there are two points there. I mean, one that the social conditions and and what happens in China as a society as it evolves is one thing, but the point that you made earlier on, Kim Hwat, uh, what we do have that is actually quite unique is is the position of leader has now been redefined in an interesting way. So the question that she put was, you know, what what do you think of, of Xi Jinping? Let's let's get a, a sense of from, from all, all parties. Go. Okay, uh, maybe I'll start. I'll say that uh, maybe a quick response to what she said about you know the Great War and that sort of stuff. I think there have been a lot of things written about China because it's a large country, right? In terms of People is the biggest concentration of people in the world. So China has always been saying that I've got enough of my own problems. Can you imagine the whole world is just one country? Who's going to rule it? You have a lot of problems. So China is a miniature of the whole world. They're saying that although I've got large land mass, you know, I've got Muslims on the other side, I've got different cultures, religion, the Mongolians. It's difficult ruling my country. I wouldn't want to rule the world because I already have trouble ruling the country. So they have been very focused on their domestic issues rather than imperialistic. Not from a, a theology point of view, but from a practical needs perspective, right? How many, how many households can we, we run, right, ourselves? So, so that's just the quick response. But coming to Xi Jinping, when I say about consolidation of power, I just wanted to draw some observations. A lot of people say that uh, our founding Prime Minister, Lee Kuan Yew, is a benevolent dictator. It's the concentration of power. It's how you use the power. If it is used properly, you have what you see. If it's not used properly, and I will not mention some other countries' name, it is what they are. So, so it's a question of how do you then use the power. But having said that, I think LKY in 1992 decided that as a system, there need to be checks and balances. So he started this elected president in order to check, just in case, because of certain freak elections and the powers, uh, the parliament is controlled by other people, we need to have some checks and balance. So at that time, I don't think PAP was fearful of losing the election, but he decided that he needed that check and balance. So he put in place the elected president 
in order to control not everything that the government does, but two main things. One is the reserve, so that you cannot unlock, so that you won't bankrupt the reserve. The other one is the nomination of key appointment holders, those people that run the ministries, the stat boards, so that you cannot overnight change people so that you know the country will get in a mess. So what I'm saying is that I think when Xi Jinping uh, consolidation of power, while if he does good things, it's good. But the question has always been, if the power structure is such that it resides in one person's hand, there's no assurance that the person that comes after you will do that. And we have also seen that in some neighbouring countries, whereby if you have a structure whereby you hold it all in one power, then even the people who design the structure cannot bring it down because you have designed it as such. And, and hence, I think uh, uh, Mr. Lee tried to put in place that. Then the question is, uh, President Xi, while he does good things, would he then implement other things before he pa pass on his term to another person to have this check and balance to make sure there's no absolute power such that, you know, you are a good emperor in, in the Chinese dynasty, but there's no assurance that the emperor coming after you is good. Then it could lead the whole country into chaos again. So whether would he do the same thing like what Lee Kuan Yew tried to do? I don't know. I'm just uh, throwing it out there. Yes, I would say uh, that uh, I, I would refer to his book, uh, uh, and the title of the book is The Rejuvenation of the Chinese Nation. So it means that he is uh, very much concerned by China first. And uh, if Trump was not saying, uh, let's America great again, he would say, let's make uh, China great again. So it will be absolutely the same approach, because they are first thinking about their own country. And if they started, uh, uh, Belt and Road project. It is not because they wanted to help the others. It is because it was needed in order to do so because the uh, GDP was not uh, growing at the same pace as before. So they needed to find some uh, relay of growth outside rather than inside the country. So I'm really convinced that it is the reason why they are going abroad and uh, that the main thing is the rejuvenation of the uh, Chinese nation. So this rejuvenation goes through all the different aspects. It can be political, it can be social, it can be economic. So we are focusing here on the economic issues, but I'm sure that the political and social issues will come back very soon because you cannot ignore them for a very long time. Okay. And maybe in the future we'll have some political and social problems within the country. You have a Gini index which is close to uh, 0 0.5, indicating great uh, inequality in the distribution of income, and I'm not so sure that this can be uh, accepted forever. What uh, most worries me about China, in, in terms of the risk uh, that I think there, is exactly, as you mentioned, the accumulation of power on an emperor. You've used the word an emperor. And Xi Jinping has taken on this imperial uh, position, which he's built up uh, for himself doing away with the checks and balances which Deng Xiaoping had introduced into the system. For in, and that means that she, as the representative of the Communist Party, which we haven't mentioned so far this evening, but is absolutely vital to, I think, any understanding of how China operates at the moment, the Communist Party has now taken an absolutely predominant position, um, for instance, in economic policy, it is now Liu He and the Politburo who decide on the big economic uh, measures at meetings chaired by Xi Jinping very often, rather than the government. The days of Zhu Rongji are long, long gone there and the Prime Minister. And I think that power accumulation in itself uh, produces a danger. And the concentration on the party and party strengthening also creates the problem that uh, alternatives may be dismissed simply because they don't fit in with the party. And the closing down of society, which you, 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 you alluded to, and so on, I think is, is quite a, a negative element in that. Yeah, maybe a quick rejoinder, just to uh, clarify you know, the word emperor. As I say, a good emperor can do a lot of good, right? So at a certain stage of development, you have power concentration in the leader's hand. If the leader is good, he can do a lot of good. Otherwise, if you don't have that, most leaders can't achieve anything, right? Every five years, a different government and will split Congress or whatnot. It's challenging. 
But the question is sustainability. So you can't assure that the one that come after you will also be equally good. And that's the challenge. And, and the, it would be a fantastic evening to sit there and actually discuss the issues of governance in the 21st century. Uh, I, I wonder whether communism means anything anymore, uh, whether anybody knows what it means anymore, and whether the ideas of how one governs uh, a society needs to be reconsidered in the light of what Singapore has done. I'm not sure Singapore's checks and balances are <laughs> unnecessarily what everyone thinks they are. And I've had some wine, incidentally, so <laughs> I, can, I can say that. Um, my name's Alex, and I live in Singapore. And as a disclaimer, one of the panel members is my old man. Um, so um, my question is actually a, a follow-up to what, what you just asked, which is some 15 years ago, um, Gordon Chang wrote a very famous book about the coming collapse um, of China, which proved to be completely wrong, but was premised on um, slowdown in the economy, social unrest, collapse in the, the Communist Party, and so on. So in light of what you've just been talking about and the new political model with Xi and the new political model with the concentration on the Communist Party, um, if you were to project forward, what is the stability of China? Um, and are there threats to the actual stability of China um, because the trade tariffs, because of the economic slowdown as the country matures, are these all potential signals to instability to the current regime? Well, if I can reply to my son. <laughs> <laughs> Jump in straight away. Um, I think uh, there are serious economic uh, challenges for China at the moment. A recent book that came out in, in Britain, a very well-argued book, says red, four red flags for the economy. Uh, the debt, the currency, uh, the demographics, and I forget what the fourth one was, uh, and so on. And for instance, what has been very interesting, to come back to your question, uh, or your remark, uh, with Xi Jinping, is that he's accumulated all this power, but still how he actually exercises it is either quite cautious or not that effective. If we take, for instance, the deleveraging, it's now, what, two, two three years since we had the deleveraging uh, drive bit campaign being launched, uh, and it's still been very slow. At best, it's just capping uh, what, what's there. So there is the question of the ability of the party, above all, to reform and change the economic system, which since uh, 1989, it has used to give itself a legitimacy there. And this is obviously quite a major issue and problem involving the state sector and everything else. I don't think the trade war is that important in this element, but to go back to what others were saying earlier, the real, if I were Xi Jinping, I think what probably he's thinking of as he goes to, uh, to sleep at night is how do I make this economy more efficient and more sustainable? Chattamu, can I get you to comment on this? Because yes, there's a, there's a very quickly. The <laughs> the, a lot of the Gordon Chang argument and subsequent arguments have always been predicated on these economic fundamentals that actually, if you look at them to a large extent, they're economic fundamentals that are predicated on, on very strict models that make sense in a capitalist economy and therefore in, in many ways are not applicable in the China situation. And maybe that's why uh, all these threats uh, to the China banking system never turned out because the tools were different uh, and the problem was different. But uh, can you address that issue? I mean, are we, are we comparing apples and pears here or is there something we need to worry about? Well, definitely the economic uh, uh, structures are completely different from China and the other countries, especially at that time. So, so it was uh, very difficult to predict what would happen. I would just say that as long as uh, the government provides hope for the citizens, and especially hope to have a better life. That's the most important thing. If people believe that they will have a better life in the next two years, in the next five years, in the next 10 years, they don't care about the political situation and they will give them peace, uh, they will not be involved there. But if you are telling people that the economic situation and the improvement, it will not be the same one as in the past decade, in that case, people are wondering where is the social contract? Where is the trade-off that they have with the government and with the others? So this is where I think they will start to complain if they believe that the hopes are not fulfilled, if they believe that the government doesn't deliver what they promised 
that is to have an, uh, an incessant increase of growth and permitting them to have a better life, especially for people coming from countryside and going to the coastal area. And people in the coastal area, what is their life in the future? Will they still have a better life for the children? These are the fundamental questions that we have. My name is Mehmet, I'm from Denmark. Uh, my question concerns the future of the US dollar, and in particular, its use in glo global trade. Uh, obviously, China and Russia have been very critical uh, of the system, which is not working. Uh, do you see a potential attack on the US dollar in the next, say, five years as likely, and what do you think the US reaction be? And in general, how do you see the future of the, of the US dollar? Uh, I would say that uh, <coughs> I, I cannot see uh, an attack on the U.S. dollar. Uh, it will still be uh, the dominant uh, currency. As you know, China and Japan, uh, they hold very huge uh, uh, bonds, uh, treasury bonds from the United States. So if there are two countries which could attack, it will be Japan and China. But Ch Japan attacking the United States, this is very this is science fiction or something <laughs> like that. I don't know in which uh, twilight zone we are uh, that we can imagine this kind of thing. But uh, uh, a follow up question. Ah, yeah. <laughs> but they used to have this before. <laughs> so I, I cannot see th uh, this will happen. Uh, we have another option, which is the cryptocurrencies. So the cryptocurrencies uh, may represent, so <laughs> since uh, uh, Tim likes this very much, <laughs> his trepidating. <laughs> blockchain and the cryptocurrencies next month. so that's right so uh, we have just announced for the next month this <laughs> kind of discussion so this could be uh, something of interest uh, in the past we used to have many countries complaining about the domination of the US dollars and nothing has been done because the United States is still extremely important and uh, they cannot see how one country can go alone against the United States and having a coalition let's say Russia, China, uh, the European Union, and the others going against the United States is also very difficult but to But is, is the dollar as all-powerful as it once was? I mean, you're now seeing more people um, choosing to at least talk about trading oil in currencies other than the dollar. I, is, 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 that, is that unassailable status under threat? I, I think that it can happen, but it will be anecdotal it will not replace the US dollar. So you, you may have this attempt, and you may have the decision to use the euro, to do use the yen, or to use something else, and not to use uh, the US dollar. But I don't imagine that on a large scale, you can replace the US dollar. And certainly the evidence, you know, you used the word, uh, Temo, <coughs> there's been talk of, there's been a lot of talk of the remnant B internationalization, replacing the dollar, and so on. If you look at the actual numbers, it's tiny. I mean, in London, FX uh, uh, dealing, less than 1% is in renminbi, B, and so on. And that, despite all the efforts of the City of London uh, to push that. And I think one reason for that is the strength of the dollar. The other reason, of course, is that uh, China has a controlled currency, and you can't have a reserve international global currency that has any kind of credibility while it is controlled in the kind of way that the exchange controls in China pertain. So it's interesting that we sort of come almost full circle in a way because we uh, started off talking about, talking about how China is such a threat to the global economy uh, and actually the reality is that we're still underpinned by the same force